In this video, I want to tell you about the time splitter tools speedrunners are using to track their time and how this relates to game hacking. But before, let's play some more Pwn Adventure 3 because we need to learn about something first. In a previous video, we were able to use the tool Cheat Engine to find the variable of the selected skill in memory. But if you tried this yourself, you might have run into an issue when you close and reopen the game, because in that case, Cheat Engine would just show question marks. Or it might show random other values. This is because the data is not located at the same address anymore. For example, ASLR changes the addresses of the memory regions. So how do we deal with that? Let's attach Cheat Engine again to the game and throw away the current address list because it will be useless. But now that we know the values of the skill number variable, we can directly search for the value. So first slot selected would be a zero and we found 64 million. Then let's select the second slot, search for value one, 3300 possible values left. We can see that some values are already different again, so we can just scan again for the one, 200, 190, uh, 181. Switching to the third slot, we search for two, one left. Okay, we found it again. This time, we want to ensure that we find this value every time when we restart the game. In theory, the game itself has to know where the value in memory is, right? We can again think about this from a programmer's point of view. There could be a global general game object, and that game object has maybe a reference to the world object, and the world object has a reference to the player, and the player then has a variable for the slot number. And if you know somewhat how that is implemented on the lower level, you know that objects are somewhere in memory, so they have an address, and their variables are located at some offset from the start of the object. So basically, you just have to always follow these pointers and offsets until you reach the end. And of course, the awesome tool Cheat Engine has a feature called Pointer Scan that can help you with that. So let's do a pointer scan for this address. This is the address we want to get to. And then there are a lot of settings that you can control when searching for these pointer offset paths. We will leave it mostly by the default settings, except that we change the restriction for the base address. Base address must be in specific range. The base address is where the pointer chain has to start, the root, the one fixed address. And with the setting, we can define a range where it has to be. From last video, we know the code that accesses this variable is from the game logic DLL. So it makes sense to guess that this DLL might have some global variable pointing to some object which we can use. So I looked at the memory map again to find the rough memory range and add it there. Now let's search. Depending on the size of the memory, this can take a while. Fast forward, here we are. We found over 20,000 possible pointer paths. And look at this one. Apparently at this address here, so from the base address of the DLL, we go up hex 97E48. There is some address and when following that address and go to the offset hex 110, there we find the address or pointer to our variable. We can also sort based on other columns here that helps us to discover other possible nice pointer paths. So we can add another possible path. Also, do you notice how the last offset here is hex 110? Remember when we looked at the assembly accessing the slot ID value? It was from offset hex 180 from ESI. And we had ESI assumed to be the player class. So it's a bit unexpected that we find here addresses where the slot ID appears to be at offset hex 110. But looking at the list, you can also find pointer paths where it has the expected offset hex 180. Because I trust the assembly offset a bit more than guesses by Cheat Engine, I decided to rescan the pointer list for pointers with the last offset hex 180. This is very similar to how you scan for values. Now we just scan for better pointer paths. But let me show you how you can check if you have a reliable pointer path or not. Let's close the game. So now the process is gone and the memory is of course unknown. So let's start the game again. Log in, select the character, and we are back. Attaching to the new game process and we want to keep the current address list. Now look at the address list. The hard-coded address now points to somewhere else in memory and there is a zero. We know that this would be wrong. The third pointer path also seems to point into bad memory. So that one wasn't reliable. 
But these two pointer paths here seem to successfully point to somewhere with the value 2. And that looks correct because we have selected the third slot. Let's delete the wrong ones. It could also be a good idea to redo this process of playing the game, closing it, restarting it and so forth a few more times just to be sure that the pointer path is really 100% reliable. And if not, you redo the path scan and select a different one. But why did we do this? What's the purpose of this pointer path? Well, this is very useful for when you want to write programs like trainers, bots or cheats. We can write code that gets the address of the game logic DLL and then follows that pointer chain to find the address of that value, which you can then use to change it. The skill selection is maybe not the most useful variable, but of course we can imagine that we find a lot of other values like that. Maybe we could even find the address of the position to teleport or move around. But that is something for another episode. I have a special idea for that. I want to talk about something else now. I know a lot of people don't like cheaters and maybe wonder why I would make a video like that. But I want to show you that this can also be used for more productive things. Would you have guessed that these hacks are used by speedrunners all the time? Here's for example the current Bioshock Infinite world record speedrun by Glurmo. And let's look at the timer when the map changes. It made a split and moved to the next one. So have you ever wondered how these automatic time splitters from speedrunners work? They don't seem to have to press a button when they progress in game, it seems to happen automatically. Let's have a look at a tool called LifeSplit. LifeSplit is a timer program for speedrunners that is both easy to use and full of features. It has this feature, game time is automatically read directly from an emulator or PC game and you can use it by switching the game time under compare against. Do you have a guess how they might be able to do that? Let's check out the autosplitter documentation. LifeSplit has integrated support for autosplitters. An autosplitter can be one of the following. A script written in the autosplitter language, ASL, or a LifeSplit component written in any .NET compatible language. The autosplitting language, ASL, is a small scripting language made specifically for LifeSplit autosplitters. An ASL script contains a state descriptor and multiple actions which contain C sharp code. So what are state descriptors? The state descriptor is the most important part of the script and describes which game process and which state of the game the script is interested in. This is where all of the pointer paths which the autosplitter uses to read values from the game are described. Pointer paths. We know pointer paths. And they are used here to read values from the game, like we read the selected skill number from memory. Let's read just a little bit further. The optional base module named base module describes the name of the module the pointer path starts at. Every exe and dll file loaded into the process has its own base address. Instead of specifying the base address of the pointer path, you specify the base module and an offset from there. If this is not defined, it will default to the main exe module. This is exactly what we also figured out with Cheat Engine. We have figured out a pointer path from the game logic DLL as the base module to the selected skill ID. Let's look at an example ASL file. This is the file for Bioshock Infinite. Here's the state definition. And apparently from going from the base address to hex 14154E8 and then following that pointer going to offset 4, we find a float that contains the information about the map loading. And the integer that tells you which map is being loaded needs apparently three offsets. And you can see how those values are being used. This is the function that checks if the timer should be started. And it will check if the map is loading and if the map that is being loaded is number 15. Cool, right? This means LiveSplit is doing the same stuff that also cheat tools are doing. They have to somehow interact with the game's memory. So here, for example, we have the process extensions class. In there, we can find the create thread function, which calls win API create remote thread. Let's have a look into the Windows API documentation. Use the create remote thread function to create a thread that runs in the virtual address space of another process. Create a thread runs in another process. So this is a typical Windows function that you can use to inject and run your code in a target process, in this case the game. This is exactly what you would do when you want to write your own cheats. You write malicious cheat code that you run in the context of the game's process. If you browse a bit more around the sources, you can also find other helpful functions like write detour. 
The comment here says, allocate memory to store the original source prolog bytes we overwrite with jump to the destination along with the jump back to the source. So you can use this to overwrite part of the game's code, jump to your own code and then jump back. This is also called a hook, a function hook. And that's exactly the same kind of stuff you would do for any kind of game hacking or cheating. I mean life split is literally game hacking. But it's not only game hacking. This is what also malware might use to hide its code or steal data from a running program. And browsing a bit more you can even find code that seems to hook keyboard presses in order to detect global keyboard shortcuts, probably for when you are in the game and you want to interact with live split. But this could easily be changed to log key presses for a keylogger. You get the idea. Just to make it 100% clear, I'm not saying live split is cheating or malware, I'm just saying that it uses the same programming techniques. I think you can see that learning about game hacking, reverse engineering and how the basics of cheating works is useful. The cool thing is that game hacking can be really fun because you play around with games, but the skill you learn are applicable in many other areas as well. I hope this shows you how interconnected the skills are and how learning one topic can benefit you somewhere else. And I also hope it shows you that some skills that on the surface might seem only be useful for malicious purpose, be it online game hacking or malware development, they can also be used for awesome, useful tools like LifeSplit, a tool that has probably had tremendous positive impact on the joy of thousands of people. And I wouldn't be surprised if the developers of that tool haven't had a history in game hacking themselves.